Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about the Lotus Evora. That's not a car that usually comes through our press fleet, so we're super excited to talk about that. Road test editor Zach Palmer uh, spent some time in that. Then we've got a couple of updates on our long-term fleet. That's the Subaru Forester and the Volvo S60, two pretty interesting cars that we've had for, for quite some time now. So we're going to get into that, what we've been doing with them, and all that good stuff. We're going to get into some news. Uh, the Land Rover Defender is in short supply. Uh, the story went up this week on our site. Uh, you'll want to check that out. We're just going to kind of talk about how we're feeling so far about the Defender. None of us have driven it yet, but uh, we're all very excited too. Uh, there's also news of a Tesla 12-passenger shuttle being built for the uh, the boring car company or the no boring company, as he calls it. Um, kind of messed that up, but you know what I mean. It's going to be an interesting Tesla development, if you will. And then finally, we will spend some money. Uh, but with that, I'd like to welcome in road test editor and fleet manager, Zach Palmer. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good today. How about you? Doing good. It's, uh, yeah, you know, weather's getting kind of nice here in Michigan. So, you know, that's, it's all right. It's starting to really feel like summer. Let's put it that way. And joining me on the other line is senior producer, Chris McGraw. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. How about you? Not bad. Not bad. So let's jump right in. The Lotus Evora. Uh, it's an elite club here, at least on this podcast, because I've never driven one. Um, what was it like there, Zach? Take it away. Yeah. So the uh, the specific Evora that I had was the Evora GT, which is the new one. Uh, you know, you uh, it's new for 2020. They're making it for 2021. Um, I was actually chatting with uh, one of the Lotus PR people. They're hoping to sell about 400 of them this year. So Elite Club is definitely uh, a good way to put it because you won't see many of them out there, period. Um, this is other than the Evora GT430, this is the most powerful Evora ever sold in America. Uh, it's, it's nearly the most intense of them out there. But, uh, you know, at, at this point, you know, we know the Evora has been out there for a while. You know, it's, it's been on sale since like the, the early 2010s. And, you know, they've, they've gone through many different iterations. And this, there's, there's a chance this could be one of the last ones. So... Super, super excited to actually catch it right at the end. You know, driving a Lotus is, uh, well, it's it's different than driving pretty much every other car out there. I mean, so I guess I'll start with the looks. Like, so it, it arrives in the driveway and yeah, it, it, it looks like a very exotic mid-engine sports car. Uh, the look from the back is is definitely the best. Uh, you know, you, you, you look right in there and you can see the red engine cover uh, says Lotus on it. You know, it's obviously not a Lotus engine. It's a 3.5 liter V6 from Toyota. Uh, the same thing that's in the Camry. But this one has an Edelbrock supercharger on it. With, uh, so, th so 416 horsepower, 332 pound-feet of torque. Uh, yeah, lots of power. And, uh, you know, you, you, when you're looking from the back, there's actually um, these little holes right below uh in in the bumper where you can actually see through to the giant 295 michelin pilot sport cup two tires back there uh i mean they're they're about the closest things that you can actually get the slicks on on a street car uh, a lot of really hot sports cars have them and uh yeah it's just really wild to see such wide huge tires on this car that is you know, it's it's a small sports car. It's it, it it's not something big. You know, it's it's definitely bigger than say a Miata, but not not hugely so. So stupid amount of rubber, very very wide rear end, a lots. I mean, it has a huge diffuser back there, one giant exhaust tip. Uh, it's a uh, it's a certainly a sight to behold, and you know, it, everybody that passes you while you're on the highway out driving. You know, I, I, I got more thumbs up, uh, you know, hey there man, waves in this car than literally any other car I have driven in my entire career. And we all drive a lot of cool cars here. So that's 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 saying something that that a lot of, I mean, people see the car, they don't necessarily know what it is. They see, oh, it's a Lotus. I haven't seen one of those before. So uh, yeah, but the actual driving, you know, this is... 
it's it's a very single-minded machine from from the second you get in it so the the, the actual like starting procedure threw me for a loop uh lotus actually had to explain it to me because it's it's confusing uh you get in you take the the weird little key fob without any uh symbols on it or anything there's just some random buttons there's no unlock lock so i actually have to tell you which button is which uh but you you insert that into the traditional uh key fob and uh twist it then you press a little button on on the fob itself so twist button and then there's an engine start button on the left side of the steering wheel right where porsches are you push the clutch in and then you hold that button and then the car starts so it's 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 kind of weird it's it's like a three-step process for for starting the car but hey you know you're in something special you're in a lotus uh it's it's actually kind of cool and and it grew on me over uh the week of driving but um yeah like i said sing, single-minded car um you know you, it's you, you, as soon as you take it around a corner you're like wow okay hydraulic steering this is not an electric powered rack so you have all the steering feel in the world uh the the, the car is just telepathic in the way you just throw it around a corner it stays flat uh and it just it goes around anything that you throw at it pretty much better than almost any other car out there um you know i i have not driven a cayman gt4 but i imagine that is it's it's closest contemporary for uh you know astute and fantastic handling out there um and then the engine wow i mean you would not know that it's a a toyota camry v6 back there um when you take it under an underpass or a bridge or a tunnel and floor it uh it is like it's one of the closest sounds to like a formula one car engine that i've i've heard it is like just ridiculous how awesome like the high-pitched shrill and then you have the supercharger whine about you know that that really comes on above like 3500 to 4000 rpm it's uh it's a super involving emotional experience um and that's something that you don't always get in a lot of sports cars these days that are synthesized electronic this electronic that you know this has a super heavy clutch um you know i i mean it's it's heavier than most clutches in anything today bar none um and the the manual transmission itself it's it's actually a uh, a toyota transmission but there's nothing nothing bad about it at all i mean it's it's like a slot it's a really really great feel in into each gear um it's it, it, it's sort of notchy but uh you know you you really feel like you're in something special like you're in a sports car because the the seating position super down low on the floor um you have this really great leather and alcantara steering wheel in front of you you know there are, there are not many buttons in there the buttons that are in there are not exactly uh you know hundred four thousand dollar buttons because well all the money has gone into the handling and steering and acceleration so you know you're you're left with some switch gear that maybe you know is is not up to porsche standards and that uh that's definitely something that you know could possibly turn you off but i think if you're looking for something that's the ultimate ultimate driving you know that is what you care about you want to take it on a track you want to take it out on you know a sunday morning and go for a blast um there's there's just nothing else like it it's new today that that offers that same level of involvement that that same level of feel that you get you know from from the actual steering and you can feel what those tires are doing out in front of you um, those olin shocks they make me want to put olin shocks on anything just just the way that the the car is damped you know it 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 hardly rolls it it feels so so solid around corners yet it's actually somewhat forgiving on on some roads which is something i wasn't actually expecting from a lotus um, to actually be semi comfortable um, in some normal situations so yeah it's a lot of money mine mine was a hundred four thousand dollars it, it only had about six thousand dollars worth of options on it which was was pretty shocking you, you, you can ring them up to around 130 140 with some carbon fiber packs that uh, chop off another 
I want to say about 40 to 80 pounds, depending on if you go for like a carbon fiber roof, the, the titanium exhaust. Um, but really, I mean, it, unless you're doing some like club racer kind of stuff, it's, it's not super necessary. And, uh, but yeah, like it's, it's really awesome to see Lotus still doing stuff like this. I mean, everybody else is kind of, you know, here we are with an infotainment system that is, you know, really really great now, this one actually still had apple carplay and android auto from the aftermarket alpine unit but like a, 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 everybody else has has created something much more refined and modern whereas the lotus is is a bit of a throwback you know it's a it's a throwback with the performance of a lot of new sports cars that we have these days and that is a reason why you know if if you're a really hardcore sports car kind of guy i think that you should absolutely drive the lotus and see if if that is actually more and above uh worth it to you than getting the refinement of of a porsche or you know even something like a supra as well i mean the lotus is 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 much more expensive but there's not many you know actual two-seat sports cars in this vein that uh, uh that compete right there so yeah Lots of thoughts on the Lotus. Love the car. <laughs> That's a really good sort of just like overview and analysis of, of this Lotus. I mean, it really, to me, it's such a rare thing. You, I mean, you could get a Porsche in the United States. You could get, you could get a Ferrari in the United States, but a Lotus, like you just don't see them, you know, no matter, you know, how rich you are or how well connected, you know, this one you mentioned, there's just 400 units. That's, that's so rare. Uh, so it's, I think it's really something that if you are like just such a true enthusiast who wants that, just sort of like, you're going to feel it every second you're behind the wheel and nothing else will do. This is the car for you. If you want something that's, you know, cheaper, that's where, Hey, the super comes in. You can get, I don't know, you've driven the super. What would you say? 65% of the, like experience from the supra versus this lotus uh yeah that sort of thing yeah i mean the 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 supra does fall into that uh, th that category you know of being not entirely raw like the lotus is like pretty much every single car is these days you know there's there's some sort of electric something keeping you from feeling every last little thing, you know, it's, it, it's almost like a throwback to a car from the nineties, you know, where it's, you, you're not exactly just inundated with technology and it's, it's refreshing to a certain degree because you just drive, there's no driver assistance systems. There's no, you know, automatic emergency braking. There's, there's, there's none of that stuff. And it just, it's, it's a very pure, pure driving experience that you get from the Lotus that, uh, you really, you're, it's hard to find elsewhere. So, you know, you can pay that a hundred thousand dollars and, you know, it's, it's certainly worth it for the track. If it, if you take it there. I think, uh, what's great about this is it sort of just illustrates that Lotus is still a thing. It is a viable car company. Um, they don't have the deep, the deepest, um, pocketbooks if you will um but they're there and i think that's a great thing for enthusiasts um so yeah i mean any final thoughts on this lotus you drove it i think you summed it up quite well uh check out you know our site in the coming weeks for this story can't wait to read that uh any final thoughts there zach yeah i think that i mean in a lot of ways i mean sometimes we forget about lotus to a certain degree you know when we look at a lot of sports cars that, that you should buy like hey you should, you should go buy the cayman or you should go buy the boxster or go look at a 911 you know porsche 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 or you know like a shelby gt500 or, or a camaro zl1 well the lotus is actually pretty dang fast too and uh you know i i, I think that taking that car into account with uh whatever sports car purchase um you're you're thinking of making uh I, I think you'd be really happy if you actually went and drove an evora and it, it might actually be enough to uh make you want one like i 
I took uh, one friend for a ride that uh, that I've seen, and he was like dead set on wanting a Shelby GT350, like dead set, like this is the car he wanted. After spending a few minutes in the Evora, he's like, no, forget it, Zach. I don't want the Shelby GT350 anymore. I want the Lotus. It's just, it, it has that way of like grabbing you and just pulling you in as like, one of the best driver's car out there you know e e even from the passenger seat so just don't forget about the lotus it's out there it's awesome uh definitely give it a shot if uh if you're in this uh this sort of price bracket looking for a sports car and even even used ones as well i mean they it, they might not have 416 horsepower like this one but you know if you can look one with like 25 ish thousand miles on it they're down in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range now, so it's somewhat more reasonable to uh, you know look at look at a used Lotus if uh, you're willing to take that risk. You know there always is you know you're you're buying this car. It's still you know there's there's the hint of of kit carish in and amongst all the leather and Alcantara and super nice materials inside there, but. Uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely one that um, I think anybody that buys it is gonna absolutely fall in love with. I could see myself as being a Lotus guy simply because when it comes to certain cars, I really like like what's different or maybe a little less mainstream. You know, like when we talk about our best like sports sedans you know, always inevitably you get into like the BMW versus Mercedes conversation, like the C-Class always inevitably rises to the top for its just overall excellence. And I'm like, well, what about, you know, the Cadillac or the Alfa Romeo? And it's just like, I'm drawn to these, these style plays, these dynamic plays. So, you know, I, I see how the Lotus could really just appeal to somebody, especially if you had like, like, let's say you live out in the country and you've got a lot of great roads. Maybe you're a member of like some sort of track like group or something. And that's going to be a big part of what you're going to do with this car. That's where you probably do want to spend, you know, the money and look for something like this. Or like, to your point there, Zach, look for a used one, you know, because then you get, you know, all this performance and capability. Whereas, I can't believe I'm saying this, the Supra is almost more like your daily driver, you know, your daily, you know, enthusiast sports car. So, so that's the Lotus. Uh, pretty excited to get to talk about a Lotus. Um, they're relatively rare, even in this business. I mean, literally, I think the last time I saw one come through the press fleet was like 08 when I was at Auto Week, which is quite some time ago. It, they come through and I mean, honestly, journalists, you sometimes just miss them. You know, you're traveling that week and you miss them. But for me, this is a pretty rare experience. So it's pretty awesome that, um, you know, that we, you know, we get into it, we talk about it on the podcast and, and so on. So let's uh, go ahead, Zach. One more thought. Yeah. Lotus is actually telling me that they, uh, they were going to have more cars. So maybe they will be less rare soon. Love we'll it. We'll see. Long maybe there will be more, more long-term Lotus Evora. Long-term yes. Lotus Evora. Uh, yes. we probably should buy a helmet <laughs> if we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> I would be into uh, it because I mean, can you imagine signing that thing out? You would just have oh, like, man. <laughs> go take the Avora for the night. Oh man, that would be hey, so cool. As, as long as you don't need to carry anything, I, I guess I didn't actually get into the back seat. Uh, there, there technically is a back seat. Uh, you, you can't actually get back there and, unless you're very, very tiny. Uh, like even when you put the seat forward, there's about like one centimeter of, of foot space. It's great to toss a bag or, or, or some groceries, but yeah, also just totally pointless other than that. And there is a trunk. You could kind of fit some, some, a bag back there, but yeah, would not be the most utilitarian long-termer at all, but it would be a lot of fun. Well, can you imagine <laughs> pulling up for curbside pickup and you're like, yeah, man, put it in the back seat. And the guy looks at you like, what? And you've got like 10 bags of milk and eggs and stuff and a case of beer. I I actually did get uh, some some curbside pickup on Saturday. Uh, the the guy that came over to deliver the food was like, "Hey man, I hope you're not eating this in the car." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no." <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. won't be eating this in the car. He's like, "The car is too nice." <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, so yep. 
All right. Good so times. speaking of long-termers, let's talk about the ones we actually have, which are a lot less um, crazy than the Lotus. Uh, McGraw, you spent some time in the Forester. Check out that story and that video on our site. It went up last week, um, so but still up there, so check it out. Uh, give us an overview of your take. Uh, you took, you actually put some miles on it too. So just tell us what you did. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, uh, I flew into Detroit and then, uh, drove both the long termers, uh, to the Chicago auto show back when auto shows were a thing. Uh, so dating myself a little bit, this was early February. Yeah. Early February. So it's been a little while. Um, I think it's a, <laughs> It's kind of a good transition to talk about the Forester. Greg, you said you like cars that aren't necessarily mainstream. And I think Subaru has put all its effort into making the Forester as mainstream as possible. Um, I used to be a, uh, a big Forester fan. Um, I've driven pretty much every generation and uh, have done some crazy things in Foresters uh, a few years back. Um, flew down to South America and we drove like from uh, northern Argentina all the way down to the southern tip uh, in Outbacks, Foresters and Cross Tricks. Um, so definitely have put uh, put Foresters through their paces all over the place. And uh, when I lived in Michigan, was totally in the market for a Forester. Uh, my wife and I ended up buying a Cross Trek instead. But um, when I... So when I first heard we were getting the Forester as a long term, I was pretty pumped, except for the fact that Subaru for the 2019 model year, which is the model year we have, got rid of the turbo, which was super disappointing to me. Um, they also got rid of the manual transmission. Um, I think that had more to do with the safety systems, but the the turbo itself, uh, their reasoning behind it is a little... I don't know. I think it's kind of bull. Um, when, when it first came out, they said that their interpretation of sportiness does not rely on engine power, which I don't know about you guys, but my definition of sportiness 100% relies on having engine power as well as some other things. Um, and so instead of having the turbo, which I think was around 250 horsepower, we now just only have the naturally aspirated uh, engine, which is like around 180, I think. And if you couple that with the the fact that it has really gotten away from like kind of the boxier look of the first, second, third generation, and it's been moving away from that, you know, each generation, it looks more crossover. This one definitely, to me, looks the less, the least... Uh, boxy of, of them all. It, I don't know. I was a little disappointed in it. Um, when we're just talking about the engine, just talking about the looks. Um, that being said, uh, getting in it, it was definitely the most comfortable Forester I've ever driven around. And specifically driving from Detroit to Chicago in February, uh, I was really thankful we had some snow tires on there. Zach, I think you drove it home from Chicago. Um, I did, yes. Yeah, and that was not the best of weather situations, if I remember correctly. So I was glad we threw the, we had some gold wheels from our uh, long-term WRX, <clears throat> which I think we had back in 2015, threw those on there and threw some snow tires on there. Um, at first, I when I arrived and picked it up, um, it so the tires are a little smaller than uh, what, are recommended for that size of vehicle but it's just you know what we had and snow tires are better than not snow tires regardless of if they're slightly smaller than the uh, oem measurements so i was at first i was like man i don't know how this is going to handle with the smaller tires on it um but it ended up handling really well and and uh performed pretty well in the snow um i don't know how do you guys feel about subaru getting rid of the turbocharger in the forester for the 19 model year I am, uh, I mean, there are still some competitors that offer some, you know, quicker turbocharged options like the CX-5 Turbo, the Escape with a 2.0 Turbo, and Equinox with a Turbo. You know, 
and Subaru could totally play with those guys if if they kept their their turbocharged engine, which they have now. I mean, they they have that that uh, that two point five turbo in the Outback, in the Legacy, in the Ascent. Uh, it would be it would be a lot more fun. I mean, the it, it, the car is not necessarily um, a, a great handler by any means. The Mazda is better at that, um, and I think the the Escape is also a slightly better handler, but yeah, I mean, I could totally go for an optional turbo engine. Subaru could charge more for it, and you could make a lot of, you know, maybe not a lot of, but at least some Subaru traditionalists, constant Forester buyers who like that, you know, give them something to be excited about. Because right now, like you said, yeah, the the Forester is about as normal as any other crossover out there. It's like a CRV, a Rav4. You know, it's not that unique. Uh, boxer weird flavor of crossover slash wagon that it used to be and yeah it's just there's there's nothing to get super excited about it's uh it it basically is just there to to do a job to be a crossover and like you said you know it's it's super comfortable it 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 does that job well so much space inside of it because of the uh the, the the large shape love the visibility but yeah give me a turbo engine and i'd be much happier I actually think it's reasonable to just to offer both is what I guess I'm saying. Like if you yeah. want the the less powerful yeah. engine, that's fine. I can see why people, you know, it's it's cheaper, probably more fuel efficient. I think it's entirely reasonable that use this engine as an entry level engine and then offer the turbo as an upgrade. And if you want that, great. I think you know, the crossover segment right now has become a place where you do need to have an engine that has some guts, some up level of power. And if you don't have it, you're going to kind of fall behind. You see this a lot with, you know, General Motors and Ford still offer a lot of fairly potent engines in this segment. You know, GM still has that 3.6 liter V6 that they drop into quite a few of their crossovers. So, I mean, you kind of got to like actually, you know, bring something here to like, you know, really compete. That being said, I don't know if like the average Subaru customer is going to be turned off the Forester, so to speak. Like, I think if you want a Forester, you're still going to get a Forester. You're just going to be like, oh man, this thing's slower or, oh geez, you know, I wish I could have, I wish they offered a little bit more power. Um, So to kind of, to kind of uh, flip that a little bit, the average, yeah, I, so I get it, uh, Subaru doesn't really have an incentive, right, to to offer the higher engine because they're selling Foresters and Crosstrex. That's another complaint of mine is that the Crosstrek's too slow. Um, they're selling them as fast as they can make them. So, like, th- they're sitting there going, all right, why do we need to do anything to these if we're selling out? You know, and I get that. But um, now that I've moved to Colorado um, and I, I drive the Crosstrek around in the mountains, it is completely gutless. And um, at 11,000 feet, which sounds like, you know, a, a tall, like a high elevation, but it's the elevation of the Eisenhower Tunnel on I-70. So we're not talking about like a, a dirt road here. That's like a, a big highway driving west of Denver. Um, at that elevation, this Forester would lose roughly a third of its power just due to the thin air because it's naturally aspirated. And that means it would be making... Roughly less than half the horsepower of the 2018 Forester XT. And so that's like, that's huge. So if you're like driving up in the mountains, which you might argue is, you know what, Chris, you live in Colorado. That's a Colorado problem. I would also argue that's a Subaru problem because five of the top 10 selling cars in Colorado are Subarus with number one being Outback and number two being Forester. So at some point, you got to start developing for your biggest markets, which in the United States, Colorado is one of them. And if you're dealing with high elevation, the naturally aspirated engines just aren't cutting it, in my opinion. I have to sit in the right lane on I-70 in the cross track and, and just go, you know, like way under the speed limit, especially when I'm camping and like the car is full of gear. Um and it's, a, it's just frustrating. And with the turbo, obviously, turbochargers mitigate a lot of that horsepower loss. So uh, it just really disappoints me that 
the Forester got rid of, or that Subaru got rid of that on the Forester. And it also, I mean, this is getting into a whole other thing. It kind of also disappoints me that Subaru is coming out with a higher horsepower Crosstrek and that one is also naturally aspirated because it still doesn't solve my problem of driving up into the mountains. Those are some great points, Chris. I think you really, um, you are a typical Subaru owner. So that's a good, um, it's a good sort of rationale there. So I'm curious as, as a Subaru owner, yeah, you, you want the turbo. If they were yeah. like, hey, we're going to give you an uprated, like naturally aspirated four cylinder or even six cylinder, or, would you, or are you just like, hey, give me the turbo, man. Give me the turbo all day okay. long. Yeah. All right. Fair yeah. enough. I suppose a Subaru might say, buy the Outback with a turbo at that point. Honestly, and I, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, totally. Because they don't. <laughs> that was one of my favorite cars I've driven like in the past six months, and I it totally blew me away. The the Outback XT with the Onyx package, which I think we may get into later, so I won't delve into that now. But totally uh, yeah. agree with you there. But it would be nice to have an option to choose it between would. different, uh, you know, Subarus rather than just having to buy the new 2020 Outback. I will say this, I don't have this problem because I would just always get the Outback over the Forester. For me, it's a pretty easy choice. I just really like the Outback and I've, that's literally been my position on Subaru since for over a decade. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Greg. Outback every day. I love the wagon shape much more than the crossover shape. And we don't, I mean, we don't even have the, the elevation problem here in Michigan. We're all, you know... Sitting at sea level ish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Great Lakes mm-hmm. level. Yep. All right. So that's the Forester. Let's talk about. Also, again, check that story out. Uh, it's on site. It's got a lot of comments. McGraw, your position was. I liked it that you actually took it like kind of a negative position and stirred some controversy. It's great to see a story get like, you know, 20 something comments and have people. It seemed to be like the general like consensus was people agreed with you. Like there's a guy in there who says he sold his 19 because it was like just too slow. Yeah. So it's good to just kind of like, you know, say, hey, this this vehicle is not what I would like it to be. So that's that's certainly a good position to stake out. All right. Let's uh, let's talk about the Volvo S60, our other long termer, which um, we've had since January. It's a beautiful car. It. Um, it's fun to drive. Uh, I'm basically doing that on memory because I drove it in January. We traded it for a couple of people, went through it. I think McGraw, you probably took it to Chicago, it sounds like, and then we had the lockdown. So, I mean, I, I think there's rumors we have this long-term S60. I can't <laughs> confirm it because I haven't seen it. You know, we've actually talked more about that electric motorcycle Irby thing lately than the S60, but... Um, What's up with the S60 there, Zach? Please tell me we still have it. We do, actually. I, uh, I drove it, I want to say, about two and a half, three weeks ago. I actually spent a, a, a good solid week in it. Nice. Um, so it, it, it does still exist. Um, it's, it's definitely not getting the, the same number of miles put on it uh, that it was getting pre-coronavirus, but that's pretty much the case with every car these days. You know, just not... Not going as many places, not traveling around the country, camping, all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, no, it is. It's still around. Um, it still hasn't even hit its its first service yet. Uh, they're pretty long service intervals every, every ten thousand miles. So I I believe we're probably hovering around the eight thousand eighty five hundred at this point. Um, Byron Hurd actually uh, has it right now. Um, I know that he was driving it around this weekend. But uh, yeah, I mean the, the 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 one I guess weird thing that, that happened when I had it, uh, you know, we were sitting in a uh, at a curbside takeout once again, waiting for food, and um, the passenger sitting next to me, um, I left them anonymous in the story, and I'll I will continue that here was messing with the moonroof uh, wind deflector, so. They were just kind of like pushing it up and down, and when they pushed it down, uh, the thing, quote unquote, broke. Uh, so basically, these these two plastic pieces that were together uh, came apart, 
and didn't really know what was going on. Uh, it, it just looked like the, the plastic had broke and when we tried to close the moonroof, wouldn't close. Um, so I got out there and I, 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 I sort of pressed the plastic pieces together um, while we rolled it shut and it did shut, thankfully. Uh, it would not have been great if it had stayed open. Uh, thankfully, you can actually get it to shut. But uh, didn't touch it after that. Took it to the Volvo dealer. Apparently, when you uh, when you press on it, there's these little plastic clips in there um, that just flew on out uh, when you press that down. Uh, it, it does not like a human force going onto that. Uh, it's it, it it just wants a gentle gliding uh, force from the moonroof, just closing gently onto it. Um, so yeah, the, the the dealer just stuck the clips in there. Um, now everybody knows to not play with the wind deflector on, on the S60, basically, because if you do, those clips could very well jump out again and you could be stuck <laughs> with, without the uh, ability to close the moonroof. Didn't he just snag? Not, not ideal. What's that? Uh, didn't he just snag those clips off of, like, a, another Volvo in the lot? He did. He did. <laughs> yeah, he just... He saw him, he was like, hey, I'm just going to go grab this off, off of another S60 in the lot. Um, and yeah, he just, he just took him right off that car, stuck him on ours, off I went. So yeah, I, I was literally in the dealer for about five minutes. It was the, the quickest service I had ever gotten at any dealership. Normally you go in there, you do some paperwork, you hang out in the lobby for a minute, then you wait for a ride to come pick you up. Nope, got in there, serviced right away looked at it instantly and i was off a couple minutes later so, service very the, nice in the age of coronavirus people don't want you lingering they don't want you reading your magazines they don't want you uh drinking their coffee they don't even want you to get out of the car so yeah I, it's a good I thing did not go in the lobby that's awesome <laughs> it, it was good that story uh, kind of uh i don't know not struck a chord but i could totally relate to it because whenever i have a sunroof open i tend to mess around with that like just you know it's kind of you know you're sitting at a light and you're driving a manual you mess around with the shifter or whatever and like same thing with the sunroof i <laughs> i read that and i was like oh my gosh i told that to totally could have been me if i hadn't you know driven it in february when it was snowing and actually opened the the uh moon roof that that was kind of crazy to me that that is an issue that and I think somebody mentioned this in the comments that they were surprised it's an issue they let get through initial prototype testing. Because I feel like that's a relatively common thing to do is mess around with that thing on on different vehicles. Or at least for me it is. Um, and to see that it just like broke. I'm like, okay, I'm never going to mess around with that again on any car. Yeah, I normally don't mess with those. But that's it's a great reason to... Uh not mess with them on yeah. any other car now because uh yeah don't want to be stuck with the moonroof open and hit some rain <laughs> that's that's pretty random that's pretty random all right so that's the volvo s60 it's uh back in one piece so uh yeah let's uh let's talk some news in the uh in the car world here we uh uh had some news this week that the land rover defender is uh gonna be in short supply this is kind of rough because um, people are so excited about this vehicle. Um, once again, this is kind of a coronavirus thing. The output was kind of slowed down at their factory. I want to say it's Slovakia. Uh, yes, it is. As I call up your story here, Zach. Um, so I just take us through it. And I just, mainly my thoughts here are just on the defender in general, but what, what's happening here? First of all. Yeah, so I, I think that this is a problem that we're going to see with a bunch of plants coming back online just slow slow going at the start uh as you know th th there could be some some starting and stopping every now and then you know one of the plant workers tests positive for coronavirus okay time to stop everything now uh we need to pause everybody needs to get tests and that's you know going to be a problem when you're trying to produce a lot of cars uh especially a high profile one like the defender that has had you know, such a huge ramp up. Everybody's so excited about it. So as soon as there's any sort of news that, oh, you know, we launched the car, but actually uh, all the dealerships are only going to get one for like the next few months. 
that's going to cause, you know, some some not so great feelings about it because everybody wants their new defender. Um, they've been waiting for it for a long time. So yeah, it, it, at this point, you know, the, the, the factory can normally make about 150,000 vehicles a year. Um, but at this point, they're probably not going to be able to hit that, that mark for like the very near future. We'll see, you know, how they eventually deal with it in the coming months. But for the time being, it may be slightly difficult to find a new Defender for sale. I did do some some searching around on AutoTrader, Cars.com, the various car websites to get a, a a nationwide look, and there are some some Defenders for sale. Um, I saw that there were I think about three in Michigan, and you know if if you look around, you might be able to find one. Hopefully, there's no huge you know market adjustment upcharge on it because of the the low supply right now, but uh, you might be able to get your hands on one if you uh, if you act fast. So, but yeah, slow supply for now, just like you said, Greg. Cool. So that's the situation. Um, the reason I kind of bring this up is I think uh, the Defender is you know one of the most important vehicles of the year, just for enthusiasts. I think you know the Bronco is also delayed. We're hearing as far as its launch of production, and I think it's just it's so anticipated. This is the kind of thing people are excited about. They don't want to wait. Uh, I've kind of gone taken different positions on the Defender. I didn't actually see it in person until I was at the Chicago Auto Show. I know people saw it before that. Uh, there was no Detroit show this year, so that would have been a big opportunity, I think, for a lot of us to actually see it in person. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I don't know. I was a little lukewarm at first. I thought it looked a little cartoonish, uh, but I'm starting to warm up to it. I think some of the different trim levels sound intriguing to me. And at some point, I think I'm going to get a some sort of an off-road themed SUV as maybe my daily driver. I don't know whether that's a Wrangler. Maybe it's a Gladiator. Probably not, but it might be just because I kind of like the Wrangler a little bit more. Um I like the Defender, and it's accessible at a variety of price points. And, and then there's you know an, a bunch of other ones. Like I actually have a Land Cruiser in my driveway right now that is kind of a different sort of like species of SUV. It's just so you know big and old, and it's you know it's not for rock climbing exactly, if you will. Although it could be um, and the Forerunner too. So this is just a rambling way of saying I really like sort of these rough and tough SUVs, and I think. You know, the Defender sort of needs to get in there and, like, take a shot and mix it up. I don't think there's going to be, like, the base that's going to sort of turn away from the Defender. I think all those Land Rover fans, people who have been waiting for it, are still going to be super excited. But their chance to sort of conquest, get new buyers, you know, they want to get out there. So, I mean, the coronavirus hindered everything. I mean, there's no, like, this isn't a unique problem to them. But, um, I don't know. It's interesting. I wonder how much the coronavirus had an impact on the the pricing too, because Zach, you say in your your story that you thought, um, you know, looking at the ones in dealerships online, that you know they'd be marked up like crazy, but it looks like you can buy them for prices on the sticker. And I wonder if a big reason around that, obviously, the economy is not what it was at the beginning of the year due to coronavirus. But I also wonder if, you know. I wonder if buyers are starting to get sick of the having to spend over sticker thing. You know, like there are special cars out there. Um, this the STI S209 that I recently drove comes to mind where it is ultra limited and this is your one shot to get it. But then there are just other vehicles um, that I know people have paid over sticker for. Specifically, I know somebody paid quite a bit over sticker for a Focus RS back in the day because he wanted to have it first. And now they're like 30 grand on the used market. And so um, I wonder if this is kind of like a combination between coronavirus um, causing like a smaller demand because, you know, people are just more uncertain about where the economy is going to be in six months. Or if people are realizing, yeah, the, the Defender's cool and I, I would really like to drive one. Um, but it's not like this ultra rare thing and they will be ramping up production. So maybe I'll just wait and not spend like 10 grand over. I would almost yeah. give that as advice, if you will. Like if you yeah. can sort of like contain your excitement, like 
chill out and these things will level off maybe in six months to a year. Um, you know, there's always the, uh, the, the theory that dealers might be so not desperate, but they really want to move the metal that maybe there will be some good prices. You know, I've seen a ton of ads for Jeeps in the last couple of weeks now that dealerships are reopening in Michigan. It, I mean, it's tempting. You're like, oh, geez, a Wrangler is that much money? Jeez, or a Gladiator. You know, Gladiators were going for over a sticker, you know, eight, nine months ago. So, you know, it's, I'll say this, it's an interesting time to buy a car. And it's especially intriguing when you look at like enthusiast vehicles and like what their prices might do, their availability, that sort of thing. So, so let's move on to Tesla. Tesla's always got something going on. Let's put it that <laughs> way. And um, this is interesting because Elon Musk is talking about making this like shuttle thing that would go underground uh, in LA to basically take people to the airport. Uh, 12 passengers. Uh, obviously, it would be electric. The image that we have looks kind of like a hovercraft, which is pretty wild. And I think, you know, this would be sort of for like the sub like section of his empire. It's the boring car company. I was kind of searching for the name earlier in the podcast. That's what it is. And it'd be a relatively short loop. They dig a tunnel, it'd be about three miles. And then, yeah, it would, you just, kind of be like this mini subway like thing that would be pretty quick. They'd run it up to 127 miles an hour. Uh, I'm just kind of going through the story here written by a uh, longtime contributor, Jonathan Ramsey, a uh, really nice piece. Check that out. And it's just, I don't know guys. I mean, this seems like an interesting, it's a good news story, but I always kind of wonder why like Elon does what he does, you know, it seems like he's stretching himself too thin. I know the boring company is just kind of its own thing, but what do you guys think of this project? I, I think that, um, there's a, there's a paragraph in this article that's uh third from the end that kind of, uh, s spells it out. And so they, they were going to be building a light rail, um, from the city of Pomona to the airport, which is like eight and a half miles. And, um, the city had projected it to cost one billion to one point five billion, and it would take ten years. And the boring company came out and said, "Hey, we can do this. It'll only cost seventy five million dollars, and it'll only take it'll take no more than four years." Well, first of all, when has Elon been, you know, spot on about delivering anything on time? But um, they said it gets us thinking in a new way. That is something that could be done relatively quickly and inexpensively. And then Jonathan Ramsey writes, famous last words in private and public planning. And so um, that's kind of how I feel about it. Like Elon can promise the world um, and, and he just, you know, he might deliver you the world, but it's going to be 10 years late. Yeah, also, like, that's a good way to put the, it. He, he definitely is promising the world. I mean, he's talking 127 miles per hour on rubber tires in a tunnel in a 2.8 mile trip. I mean, that's that's some pretty serious acceleration uh, to actually get up to 127 miles per hour, uh, get up there and then stop. I mean, it's it, it's definitely intriguing um, and it, it, it definitely sounds uh, it, a lot quicker than any sort of tram. But uh, yeah, like you said there, Chris, it's it's pretty wild to uh, see them come in at such a you know low price point compared to a light rail project, you know, only $75 million to make this thing that on the surface, uh, I mean, looks pretty incredible and efficient. I, I, the, the 127 miles per hour thing is just somewhat mind blowing to me because that's like almost, I mean, that, that's nearing like Japanese bullet train speeds that you're traveling through these tunnels. Uh, and it's just such a very short route. <laughs> yeah. Is it necessary for 2.8 miles to get up that fast? Like, how much time are you saving over the course of less than three miles? Like, I don't, like, if you just got up to 80 miles an hour, you know, it would, it would take you, what, 15, 30 seconds longer? It doesn't seem like it, <laughs> it needs to go as fast. Obviously, it also doesn't look as sexy then if you say it gets up to, you know, 80 miles an hour versus 120, but... The bullet That's train true. in Japan, um, when, when I wrote it with uh, producer Alex Malberg and, and senior editor John Snyder, when we were there, we got up to speeds 
north of 160 miles an hour, but it took a while and it was a long, yeah. it was like a 240 mile train ride. So, like that made sense because we, you know, made it there in two hours and it was like incredible. But the sheer acceleration and deceleration to go up to 120 some odd miles per hour in 2.8 miles just seems like it would be A, unnecessary and B, kind of uncomfortable for whoever's riding around on that. It's not something where it's like, oh, just hold on to the hand railing. And uh, no, it's like, all right, time to strap in, guys. Uh, we are moving. <laughs> all right. Uh, so that's the news in Tesla's transportation ideas. Uh, how about we spend some money? Let's do all right, it. Let's do it. Uh, jumping right in here. So uh, let's see. The lease on the 2017 Mazda 3 hatch Grand Touring. Uh, this is. Uh, the writer's car, if you will. Uh, it's up in August, and uh, they're looking to replace it with something that better fits their life slash activities. So here's the situation. Uh, they live in Los Angeles, about a 25-mile commute each way, no traffic. Married, no kids, likely none anytime soon. Uh, before the Mazda, uh, they had sports cars exclusively, so that's also interesting. Uh, love hatchbacks and wagons, not a big fan of the traditional CUV shape. More interesting data to collect here. Uh, more of an outdoorsy person and uh, likes to visit national parks. That's awesome. Been to a few of them. They're amazing. Wants heated seats, heated steering wheel, leather, radar cruise, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert. Uh, also, some more contact, context. Uh, they're a big Subaru fan. Uh, wow. Uh, let's see. Their mother is on fifth Subaru, two Foresters and three Outbacks. Twenty twenty. Uh, here's the short list, if you will. Considering a 2020 Outback XT in limited or touring, an 18-19 Outback 3.6-hour touring, uh, all good so far, a 17-18 Volvo V60 Cross Country Platinum Trim, this is hard to find, indeed, 2021 Subaru Crosstrek, uh, likely at the top trim level, and um, yeah, that's basically the short list. Was looking maybe towards uh, a used vehicle to try to take uh, away the initial depreciation, which makes a lot of sense, uh, but also really likes the 2020 Outback versus the last gen, which I would agree with after seeing at the LA Auto Show. Great, I didn't make it. Currently, Subaru is offering 0% financing in their area, which is spectacular. So there you go. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the situation. Um, Oh, the writer is Christopher. Um, so there we go. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, getting a test drive is kind of hard. Is it also getting, you know, seeing what's in dealer inventory? So kind of a two-part question here, actually. Do you guys have any insight into what would be a good choice? So standard, as well as how to handle the test drive situation. So I'll just start off with the test drive situation. Um, basically, you kind of got to do what you are comfortable with. Uh, I know dealers... In this area, in Michigan, I would assume in California, are taking, you know, all sorts of precautions. Uh, I've heard stories about them wiping down cars. These are things we do in our press fleet. It's just kind of standard procedure right now. Um, and then I would also say just educate yourself. You know, get on, you know, the CDC's website. Learn about sort of like how long the virus can live on surfaces. I'm not a doctor. I have some of these ideas in my head, but I'll let you kind of do your own research. And then just make the call. Are you comfortable? You know, is it like, hey, you call the dealer and say, hey, I want to test these cars. Any chance you can just sort of let them sit for a day? I don't know. Maybe if a dealer is, you know, desperate enough to move a car, they might consider doing that. Or at least say, hey, it's good to be wiped down. You're going to get in it and you're going to feel good. It's probably a good idea to wear a mask if you go to the dealership, bring some hand sanitizer, maybe bring some gloves, that sort of thing. That's how I would approach it. Um, you know, when I go to the grocery store, I bring those things and, you know, you just kind of get the lay of the land and go from there. Um, so that's how I would <laughs> sort of navigate the situation. And hopefully this gets better in a few months. Uh, but McGraw, let's start with you. Which of these cars would you go for? Yeah, um, I would say um, while I love uh, the V60 cross country, if you're already a little concerned about how to navigate the dealership thing, and because they're so rare, I would probably say maybe not on that that front, just because it'll be difficult to find. And then get you know getting in it and getting a test drive would be 
harder as well. Um, I have not driven the 21 Crosstrek um, because, you know, it hasn't been out yet. Uh, I would not get that e um, either. Just even with the 2.5, I kind of alluded to it in the whole Forester thing. Uh, yeah, it's a little more power, but if you love uh, national parks, a lot of them include mountains. It's going to be, uh, you know, slogging it up those mountains. Um, I have driven the 2018-19 Outback with the 3.6R um, recently, and I also have driven the 2020 Outback XT recently. I would definitely go with the newer one. Um, I loved, I loved, loved, loved the Outback XT. Uh, all these complaints about <laughs> Subaru's not having enough power and not having turbos anymore. All those are not <laughs> not directed towards the Outback XT. It's the first time since I think 09 that it's got a turbo. Um, and if you like, I like the Onyx package personally. You said you wanted leather. Uh, it has vegan leather, so I don't know. You'd have to check that out. But I like the look of it and I like the feel of it. But for me, it's not even a cl uh, close between these four. I would get the 2020 Outback XT. Zach, what's your choice? Yeah, so it, if I had to pick one from your list here, I'm 100% with McGraw. It'd be the 2020 Outback XT. Uh, but I'm going to throw one more on your plate. Um, since you're, you're interested in the Crosstrek um, and you're coming from a Mazda 3, should probably check out the Mazda CX-30. So that one is going to give you a little more ground clearance than the 3. You can get all-wheel drive in that. You can actually get all-wheel drive in the Mazda 3 now, but you won't get the ground clearance you're looking for. And the, the CX-30 is going to be much more luxurious on the inside than the Subaru is. It uh, feels a lot more premium. Even though the new Outback is a huge step up, the, the, the CX-30 is definitely um, a, a more premium car. It has everything on your list there, the heated seats, heated steering wheel, leather, uh, so long as you go with uh, a slightly more upmarket trim. And it's also going to be fun to drive. I, I think that the, the, the CX-30 um, would definitely be, you know, a more fun car than an Outback or, uh, or a Crosstrek would just because it's a Mazda and they really care about handling there. It's a smaller, lighter car. Um, to McGraw's point, yes, it is less powerful. It, it has a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated four-cylinder um, not not huge on power like the Outback XT is, but you're definitely going to have more fun in the corners while you're going to those uh, those national parks and whatnot. I've I've been all around there, and those are some fun roads. Um, and the the Outback is is respectable out there, but um, you're used to that Mazda three hatchback. Um, that's a really great handling car, and I I think you'd really really like the CX-30 as well because it's basically just a raised Mazda 3. Um, so yeah, if if you're not going to go out back, um, CX-30, 100%, but I, I, I honestly think you can't go wrong with, with either one there. Great choices. For me, it would be pretty easy. I would lean very uh, heavily toward towards the Outback XT. I think it's just, it's an all-around excellent performer. I like how it looks. I like the power. The interior is quite nice in uh, this generation of Outback. Uh, Subaru is really kind of, I think, putting it all together in regards to their their interiors. Uh, I would say this, though. I think it's worth a call or an email to at least investigate what maybe your Volvo dealer or like some Volvo dealer in the area could do for you with the V60 Cross Country. I think those are, they're really beautiful cars. They're interesting. They have character. You get that like just Scandinavian style. You really make a statement. You don't see many Volvos really wherever you live. Even if you live like maybe in the Northeast where like, you know, they're a little more common. It's still a relatively rare car simply because just Volvo's like a relatively small car company. Um, if you're nervous about the dealership experience and they can't do what you want, I think it's easy enough you walk away. But on the other hand, you know, who knows? Maybe the Volvo dealer's not that busy. You call them up and they're like, you know, you just, you get lucky. And they're like, yeah, we have one. It's been sitting here. You want to come drive it? Uh, nobody's even looked at it for a month. Maybe it's worth a trip. I would just say it might be worth an email or a call just because I personally like that car a lot. I think it's, it's really a good looking, good looking crossover. So 
So, but again, you know, you want to weigh the benefits and the risk and, you know, what's a very sensible choice that also is a really great vehicle. Of course, it's the Outback XT. Uh, I would have no problem buying that myself either. So any final thoughts, guys? I think we're uh, in pretty decent agreement about the Outback. Everybody is is, is is giving them the go on that one. So Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if in a few years there's one in my driveway. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks for being with me this week on the Autoblog Podcast. Everybody out there, uh, stay safe and have a great week.